Hello everyone. There is a story of a group of four blind men and an elephant. There are many versions of the same story. One day, the blind men were walking down a road and came upon an elephant. Not knowing what it was, they each decided to touch it so as to figure this out. The first one felt the trunk and declared, it is a snake. The second grabbed a leg and declared, it is a tree. The third grabbed the tail and said, it is a rope. The fourth touched his side and said, it is a wall. Then the four men began to argue over who was right and who was wrong as they tried to describe this animal to one another. The problem was that they couldn't agree. They argued over and over again about what this animal looks like. Friends, the moral of the story is that every human being knows only a part of the truth, although it does not mean that the truth is not there. To find out the whole truth, we must put all our experiences together. We must discover truth in all its totality. Friends, now let us use this story to understand today's Gospel text. Last week, we read that Jesus, who had been going about preaching, teaching and healing people in the region of Galilee, traveled to the Gentile regions of Tyre and Sidon and had made known to people that the grace of God will be given to all who believe, even though his mission called for him to present himself to Israel as the son of David. In today's Gospel, we read that Jesus led his disciples once again to another Gentile area Caesarea Philippi. It is about 50 kilometers north of the Sea of Galilee, located at the foot of Mount Hermon. The mountain is considered to be one of the sources of the Jordan River. In the past, the place had many names. In Old Testament times, it was known as Baal Hermon, probably because the Canaanites had built a temple for Baal, their god of weather and fertility. During the Hellenistic period, the Greeks built a temple for their god, Pan, the god of shepherds, forests, wildlife and fertility, and named this place Panias in his honor. Later in New Testament times, Herod the Great built a temple there in honor of the Roman Emperor Tiberius Caesar Augustus and his son Philip, that then the Tretarch of the Panias region enlarged and embellished the city and called it Caesarea, to perpetuate the memory of Caesar, and added his own name, to distinguish it from another Caesarea located on the Mediterranean shore. Much later, after Jesus' time, the Arabs captured the area and reverted to its old name Panias. However, it is called Banias today because there is no P in the Arabic alphabet. Friends, earlier when Jesus was performing miracles, people had speculated on his identity and came up with some possibilities. Some wondered many times of Jesus' wisdom and miraculous powers, yet saw nothing in him other than another human being and a Jewish carpenter's son from Nazareth. Some others regarded Jesus as a great leader like Moses, who had delivered their ancestors from slavery in Egypt. The thought that he might be their long-awaited Messiah never crossed their minds. They had their own ideas about the Messiah. They were thinking of the Messiah as David's successor, who would use the traditional power, military or economic dominance, and drive off the Romans, re-establish Israel's glory, and usher in a golden age. Thus, most of them are somewhat confused about his identity. Friends, like the blind men in the story, they were groping around in the dark trying to figure out who Jesus was, but in vain. It was right then Jesus took his disciple to Caesarea Philippi, where many people were still worshipping Greek and Roman gods, and asked them what people were saying about who he was. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. Friends, some people thought that Jesus was John the Baptist because people 
like King Herod Antipas, were fearing that Jesus might be John the Baptist, raised from the dead. Others regarded him as Elijah because the prophet Malachi had prophesied that Elijah would return before the day of the Lord. Yet some others felt that he was one of the prophets because they believed that either a prophet had been raised from the dead or that he had been simply transported from heaven to earth. Friends, in asking the question of what others speak of him, Jesus was trying to make his disciples truly ponder for themselves who he was. For by asking this question, he also wanted them to put together in their minds all that they knew about him and the things that he had done, and then confess what they think of him or who he was to them. Friends, Peter, perhaps on behalf of the twelve, immediately replied, You are the Christ, which means anointed. It was the custom of the Jews to anoint three classes of people, priests, prophets and kings. And Jesus, known as the Christ, the anointed one, filled all three roles. Friends, even though Peter rightly identified and believed Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus ordered him and others not to tell anyone about him, because he knew that they had not yet fully understood his messiahship. Hence, he began to teach them. Friends, what does it mean by began to teach? Until his visit to Caesarea Philippi, Jesus had been establishing sovereignty by works of power over nature, illnesses, demons, death and sin. Now, as he was turning his disciples away from Galilee, where he had experienced great success, and taking them towards Jerusalem, where he will die, he began to teach them what to expect. He said, The Son of Man must suffer greatly, and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and rise again after three days. He spoke these openly. Friends, here, first of all, Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man, rather than Christ or Messiah, just as Peter and others understood of him. Besides, the title the Son of Man was likely to stir less opposition than the title Christ. Friends, the Jewish people expected the Christ to be a descendant of King David, who would deliver his people but he had no such expectations of the Son of Man. Secondly, Jesus spoke of him suffering greatly, or many things, but did not specify the type of suffering, except the suffering that will be inflicted on him by the elders, chief priests and scribes. It is worth noting here that in Jesus' time, the elders, the chief priests and the scribes were three groups of people comprised the Sanhedrin, the ruling body for the Jewish people. Friends, a theologian observes that it was not humanity at its worst that crucified Jesus Christ, the Son of God, but humanity at its absolute best. Jesus was arrested with official warrants and tried and killed by the Jewish Sanhedrin and Roman law. Thirdly, Jesus stressed that it was by divine necessity that he had to suffer and die, and nevertheless, he would rise again three days later. Fourthly, Jesus spoke about his suffering and death to his disciples quite openly. Remember that Jesus conveyed some of his most interesting teachings through parables, which concealed as much as they revealed. Whereas about the reality of the suffering, Jesus spoke openly. But the disciples, particularly Peter, could not really comprehend the necessity of his sufferings. He took Jesus aside and told him to stop talking like that, for he believed that the mission of Jesus as Christ, the Messiah, was to save the people and not to suffer. He did not understand that Jesus came as the Messiah to earth, not to restore political power to the Jewish people and set up his kingdom, but to save all mankind from sin and death and restore its relationship with God. 
obviously Peter's thought was influenced by the Jewish understanding of the Messiah. Friends, as Peter chided, Jesus responded harshly saying, Get behind me, Satan. You are thinking not as God does, but as human beings do. Friends, without knowing it, here, Peter was speaking for Satan. He was doing the tempter's work for the moment. He was tempting Jesus to avoid the path of suffering, the pain, humiliation, shame, rejection and the physical suffering. And Jesus recognized Satan's influence in Peter and used the same words that he had himself used to Satan when he was tempted by him in the wilderness. So Jesus' rebuke was aimed at his arch adversary who was addressing him through Peter. At the same time, Jesus' rebuke was also meant to remind Peter of his vocation to follow him and not to lead him. Remember, when Jesus first met Peter, he had invited him to be his disciple and not to be his master. Friends, Peter had been following Jesus ever since, however imperfectly, but in rebuking Jesus, he stepped out up front. His focus shifted to his own desires and plans. And Jesus also knew that this was the case for all the disciples and the crowd following him. So he proceeded to give them an example of what it takes to truly be considered one of his followers. He said, whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and that of the gospel will save it. Friends, in this teaching there are two distinct characteristics of a Christian follower. 1. A Christian follower must deny self, take up the cross and follow Jesus. Self-denial means to renounce or to abstain from all earthly pleasures, even life itself, for the sake of Christ, and instead to surrender to God one's will, affections, body and soul. Take up the cross means to bear patiently and bravely everything, one's trials, problems, sicknesses, temptations and persecutions encountered for the sake of the gospel of Jesus without complaint. Follow Jesus means to submit oneself totally and unreservedly to Jesus, to conform wholly to Jesus' example in living and in suffering and dying also, if need be, to observe Jesus closely and to walk continuously and constantly with him in prayer and in the study of his word, to separate from others but stick steadfastly to the demands of Jesus, to obey wholeheartedly every command, instruction, or teaching of Jesus and so on. 2. Your Christian follower must seek to save his or her own life. Friends, here life refers to both life on earth and life after death. If a person wants to preserve his or her life now by being attached to worldly riches, honors or pleasures, he or she will suffer the loss of something more valuable, such as peace and joy here on earth and in eternal salvation in the future. Conversely, if a person renounces the worldly life and the old attachments so as to follow Jesus and his teachings, he or she will gain something so valuable, that is, a heavenly life on earth and eternal life. Friends, what is the message for us? 1. Even after having known how the story of Jesus has turned out, Many of us do not want the gospel that teaches that we must face suffering times through trials if we are to share in the glory. Rather, we want a gospel that promises an easy life and success. We want to hear that following of Jesus does not include rejection, suffering and total self-giving. We even rebuke Jesus just like Peter did. Friends, today's gospel is a reminder that the cross has always been central to our faith, and it will always be. There can be no gospel message without the cross, and the call to be a follower of Jesus is to tread on a difficult road. 2. Persecution of Christians is alive and well. Friends, in some parts of the world, 
Christians are harshly persecuted for their belief in Jesus Christ. Even though we too face some serious challenges and painful issues in our lives for our faith, we still fall short of the kind of persecutions that our fellow believers endured through the centuries and are enduring even today. Our challenges are trivial compared to what some Christians have to face, even martyrdom. And we, who have not yet been threatened on account of our faith, need to keep this in our mind. Friends, we need to pray for the persecuted Christian brothers and sisters and help alleviate their suffering in any way possible. 3. Often times, just like Peter, we want to get ahead of Jesus. We forget that Jesus is our Master and our Lord, our Redeemer and Savior, and we are His disciples. We forget that we are to only follow Him and not to lead Him or tell Him do what we want. Friends, we shall pray today that we may humbly learn to follow Christ. 4. We easily get attached to all physical things, people, situations, the past and the future. But if you are not careful, some of our attachments can control our lives, altering the way we think and act, creating a ton of misery and keeping us from fully connecting with our soul. And as a result, we are robbed of our peace and abandoned life here and now, but also of your life that is eternal. Friends, may today's Gospel text be a reminder about the need to renounce and detach from the world. And let us every day of our lives walk the path, that of the path of life and that of salvation that Jesus has shown us. Amen. God bless you.